Okay, good. Yes, so I welcome everyone here on this Bystream Plus X seminar. And uh, as many of you probably know, this is a joint undertaking between the Spin Phenomena Interdisciplinary Center, which is led by Jairo Sinova and Karin Eva Schosette, as well as a collaborative research center, Spin Plus X, which is hosted in Kaiserslautern and Mainz, led by Martin Eschelmann, Burkhard Hillebrands, and myself. And uh, most of the work for all this nice uh, series was all done by Jairo. And today, I'm just sitting in for him because he's busy with some other duties. And as you know, this is a webinar series. So webinar means that during the presentation, you will not be able to speak, but you're very welcome to put questions into the chat. And then at the end of the talk, then um, we'll uh, read out the questions. Or if you have a question you'd like to ask in person, just please raise your hand and then we will unmute you. And then once we have unmuted you, then we are able to, um, uh, you will be able to speak and uh, there can be a Q&A session. And so today it's uh, my great pleasure that uh, we have Katharina Franke. So Katharina Franke, uh, they got a master's from Penn State University. Um, and then she moved uh, to do her PhD to Freie Universität at Berlin. And then as a postdoc, she was in Lausanne at EPFL, where we just realized we were both, but not uh, with overlap, but a little bit disentangled. Um, and then uh, she became professor at uh, the Freie Universität Berlin. And uh, she is uh, well known on uh, air an analysis of surface analysis using scan and tunneling microscopy and atomic force microscopy and variable temperatures, looking at atoms and molecules. And she tries to understand the interplay of magnetic adsorbate with superconducting substrates, which will be a topic of the presentation today. So then without further ado, let me stop my sharing and hand over to Katharina. And she can sure share her screen. All right, thank you very much again uh, for the kind introduction and invitation. So yeah, today, uh, as Matthias already announced, I'm going to talk about the interplay of uh, superconductivity and magnetic atom chains. And uh, well, as you can see, this is where we are heading for building chains atom by atom. And so this has been a kind of a long journey and intense, but I would really like to point out the, the work of uh, Eva Liebhaber. So it was basically her PhD journey through this uh, and later on she, she took on board Lisa and I mean they're really a fantastic team of doing this very careful work and enthusiastically also together with Gael Riecht as a postdoc and I should really point out our very enjoyable and fruitful collaboration with the group of Felix von Oppen and his PhD students in this case Sergio Acero Gonzalez and Jakob Steiner and the samples that you see in the background already Niobium disalonide they are from Kairos Nagel in Kiel. Okay, so let me let me start off. Well, it's going to be atom by atom, as I said. So uh, why are we already interested in the single atom on top of a superconductor? I mean, first of all, you could say there's a lot of fundamental physics going on about these spin interactions. And uh, with an STM, we can, of course, locally address these properties at the single atom scale and look there at the effect of uh, the exchange coupling. Well, but as we move on, it is interesting then to, to look at larger structures that you can build atom by atom, and in particular, of course, chains of atoms. And I would like to address today the, the quantum spin magnetism in these chains. And well, how does it come along? Well, first of all, we need to create these chains, of course. Um, and once we have understood these local interactions at the single atom scale, you would ask the question, how do you couple these uh, states? And they are called yushi Baruzinov states. I will explain them just in a second. And of course, these systems, they have been uh, in the focus of interest a lot because other magnetic atom chains, but I will tell you we are in a different limit here, they have been shown to host topological superconductivity. And of course, you may ask the same question here. But for my talk, I really would like to point out that already the behavior of magnetism in the chains is, is already sufficiently interesting um, for us. So what are these, these um, Yu Shi Baruzinov states that I was briefly mentioning before? And why are these a fingerprint of local exchange interaction of magnetic atoms with the superconductor? Well, you could basically say um, that, I mean, a local spin um, that is, for example, carried by a single atom is perturbing the Cooper pair condensate of the substrate underneath. Um, and uh, well, you can describe this in a classical model and you say that there's some exchange scattering. Um, so we, we, this of course scales with some exchange coupling strengths J and it also in this classical model with the, with the magnitude of the spin. And additionally, there's also a term that's potential scattering, 
um, for the determination of where you find these subgap states, it's not that much of importance, but you will see that there's an asymmetry in the peak height. So basically, these local exchange interactions means that in a very simple picture for just a start is, let's say you have your Cooper pairs and you kind of say that you pull on one of these electrons and you push on the other one. So therefore, you kind of loosen and weaken your Cooper pairs pairing energy. And that's why you see excitations within the superconducting energy gap. OK, so well, I said that it scales with the exchange coupling strengths. Uh, what is happening there? So and I would say that there are basically two very interesting regimes. And the first one is that just imagine that you have your atom on a superconductor and you would call it a regime of this weak coupling. So then there's also just kind of a small perturbation of the Cooper pert condensate. But at the extreme other limit, you could say in this strong coupling regime, you really locally break a Cooper pair taken in parentheses. What does it mean? It actually means that locally you bind the quasi particle to the impurity side. And this is kind of sketched here with this um, opposite arrow, so the electron from the, from the bath. This is the quasi particle bound to the impurity side. Now, apparently, you have these very different regimes. And uh, of course, the coupling strength is dictating whether you're either on this side, the weak coupling, or on the strong side. And in between, there's actually a critical coupling strength. And uh, we call this that in this critical coupling strength, the system undergoes a quantum phase transition. It's actually more a level crossing, but you have these two different states on the left and on the right. Now, this equation that I was plotting before, you can also plot as this energy within the superconducting gap. So here you have plus minus delta, the energy gap around the Fermi level. And here's where these Shiba states should scale with the exchange coupling strengths, just as this uh, equation again. And basically, when we find these Shiba states at positive um, energies, then this is the weak coupling regime. We go through this quantum phase transition when the critical coupling strengths become stronger. And then we bind this quasi-particle to the impurity side. So this is where we are in the, in the strong coupling regime. Now, what do you, we measure? We measure always an excitation in an STM. Um, and what it means is that we always go from the ground state to an excited state. And in this case, for example, if the ground state is this weak, uh, perturbed um, condensate, then basically the excited state means that now we are in the excitation with the tunneling electron attaching the quasi-particle to the impurity side. While when we are already in the um, regime where the quasi-particle is bound to the impurity side, an excitation means that we annihilate it. And uh, so again, plotting just this, this behavior of the curve of the um, energy, how it should scale within the superconducting energy gap, we find that we can then do these excitations either with electrons or holes. And actually, you would just by the energy then itself, because you have this electron hole symmetry, you wouldn't be able to distinguish on which side of the quantum phase transition you are. You would only be able to see this particular excitation energy. All right, so this, this basically can be understood in a, in, a, in a classical spin model, but obviously many of you will know about condo physics on metal surfaces. Uh, and the same can of course uh, apply here as well. So the, the spins may behave quantum mechanical. Um, and what it means is that you can find a condo resonance and that would be outside of the superconducting energy gap, while at the very same time you have this Yushiba Rusinov states within the gap. And it's actually exactly the same exchange coupling strength that is driving the two um, observations of the Shiba states within the gap and the condo outside. And in the mathematical description, if you wish, you could just replace your exchange coupling strength J now by this expression, which includes the condo temperature, which of course is a measure of the exchange coupling strength. And in this picture, what we then typically refer to is that if uh, you are in the weak coupling regime, you have a free spin, while if you are in the strong coupling regime, you have bound this quasi particle, as I said before, or in other words, now you can say in this quantum mechanical picture that this uh, spin is really screened. And indeed, this, this relationship between where we have these um, Shiba states within the superconducting energy gap and how broad is this uh, condo peak is what we have already observed basically 10 years ago on manganese phthalocyanine molecules on a lead surface where we could really simultaneously measure the two energy scales. And by plotting the, the Yushiba Rusinov state energy as a function of the condo coupling strength, we have found this relationship, which indeed scales very well 
with very old theories already about it. And basically, you can see then where we are in the free spin regime or in the screen spin regime. So this establishes that these, these magnetic eta terms or molecules that you put are, of course, quantum spin systems um, individually. And of course, as the title suggests, that we would like to go to larger spin structures, for example, chains. And um, well, for this, you have to, of course, the next step is just look at the dimer. So just two uh, impurities coupled with, uh, to each other. So for example, these should be the wave functions of the yushi Rosenhoff state. They eventually overlap. So these impurities can interact. And there have been some theoretical predictions already some, some years back. And basically what they say is, well, you have these subgap excitations and they should shift because you could have some magnetic interactions, for example, of RKKY type and additionally, you can have a splitting due to hopping between the sites or effectively some hybridization. And uh, I would call, like to call this di the dilute limit because it means that not the D levels themselves, they strongly exchange couple, couple but the magnetic add atoms are sufficiently far apart that it's only the, the interaction via the substrate, namely RKKY and hybridization of the Yushi Baruzumov states. And then, of course, you don't have to stay with only two impurities, but eventually, um, you could be motivated to build longer chains, as I would like to do within this talk. And there had also been some theoretical predictions about it. Of course, you will eventually have band formation. And an intriguing part would come along when these bands that you create from the Yoshiba Rosenhoff state, they actually overlap with the Fermi levels. And then this is predicted to possibly hold some topological superconductivity. All right. So let me and introduce then the, the outline of what I would like to show you is, first of all, I would like to really show you this hybridization picture of magnetic impurities. Um, and because it's more illustrative, I would like to show it on a lead surface, but then really go on to the per particular substrate where we can also build larger structures. Um, so if we can see dimers, trimers, eventually these chains, and finally really long chains um, of these magnetic atoms on niobium bisalinite. So, well, first of all, let's look at a manganese atom on top of a, of a lead surface. And actually, we have done this already five years back. But I think it's uh, uh, illustrative to see what is happening on niobium disalinate, where it looks slightly more complicated. So first of all, of course, our differential conducting spectroscopy taken with a superconducting STM tip somewhere on the substrate shows the gap of both the tip, which is indicated here in this dark gray area, and then it's basically the gap of the superconducting substrate. And within this region, we find symmetrically in bias voltage these um, peaks, and they are associated with these Yushi Baruzinov states that I was explaining before. Well, you can find one pair that is really pronounced, and additionally, if you, if you zoom in, you can find shoulders here close to the BCS coherence peaks and also a peak that is really kind of faint, but it's uh, deep inside the superconducting energy gap. And the fingerprint, of course, it's always symmetric and bias voltage. Well, you may still question if this is true, that these are real peaks and real features. But the nice thing with the STM is now you can set your bias voltage at these particular energies where you expect the resonances to be. And then you really record the differential conductance spatially. So as a comparison to the topography, which just shows this blob, you can find these these nice shapes suddenly at the energies of these resonances. And well, if you look into this, that really looks like this clover shapes partially, and that reminded us of, of D orbitals. But really, I would like to say this is not the D orbitals itself. The diameter is just far too large. However, how we do understand it is the following. Imagine that you have your manganese atom and you put it on a surface. And in this case, it's the lead 001 surface, which means that you locally impose a crystal field on the atom. And uh, what that in turn means is that your formerly degenerate D levels in manganese, you have five electrons in the D shell, they now start to split in energy. And this crystal field splitting, I mean, in very simple pictures, you say that, well, the one where you have the uh, smallest bond length, those are the um, orbitals that are pushed up the most in energy. So this is in this case, the dx square minus y square, then comes the dz square because there's also an atom underneath. And then finally, almost degenerate, is the dxy and dxz and yz orbitals. And now, according um, to, to, to Hund's rules, you just occupy these levels individually. And well, this means that you have a single spin that creates an exchange scattering center. 
And therefore, due to this exchange scattering, you can now observe this Yushi Varuzinov state, and it actually takes the same shape of the orbital because the orbital describes the symmetry of the scattering potential. And due to conservation of angular momentum, basically this Yushi Varuzinov state inherits the very same symmetry. And this is, of course, true for all of them. So the dz square is the one that protrudes the most in that direction. And then in the plane of these three orbitals, well, the ones that protrude the most is the dxz and yz. That again looks like this, this clover shape. So with this, we have established the, the origin of these, these shapes and also what each and individually a single spin in a d orbital that gives rise to this Yushi Baruzinov states. Uh, but really, as I would like to emphasize, it's the shape that's there. The diameter is much larger, but this diameter gives us the opportunity now to couple these uh, magnetic atoms when atoms are sufficiently close spaced. And this is what we then observed also on, on lead. So there are two manganese atoms rather close by at a distance of one point, I think, five, four uh, nanometers. And as a comparison, so in, in the upper spectrum here is the blue line, which is just when the atom was isolated somewhere. If you put the second one close by and you measure on the center of one of these atoms, what you observe is the black spectrum. And well, a careful look tells you that these individual peaks are now split, they show shoulders. So you can most pronounce see it here, but you can also find it here. And the one that had been very deep inside the gap, this uh, resonance here shown as blue is now split also into two black ones and of course always symmetric in bias voltage. Well again this quick look that you may have now you may say well I'm not sure if I should believe it but because we can put now our energies again um, to these uh, where we suspect the peaks to be and we record the differential conductance maps we really see distinct differences and this is what I would like to show here. So as the comparison, we have the single isolated manganese atom, and we had understood these shapes as originating from the symmetry of the d orbitals. And when we look now at this particular peak, which had looked in energy slightly splitted, we also really at these two energies, we see different patterns. And that's true for all of them, uh, in particular here, of course, also for this state. Now, how do we understand it? And let me walk you through this like step by step for the different um, orbitals. And it's actually a very simple model that we can apply, namely the one of hybridization of these Yushiba Rusinov states. So in this sketch, I kind of just show the top view of this dx square minus y square orbital, and we put two of them close together. And the linear combination of these either gives rise, of course, to the symmetric variant that we have this intensity across the bonding direction, or we have this nodal plane in the anti-symmetric version of the linear combination. And I think that this is nicely also revealed in the DIDD map. So here you have this nodal plane, while here you have increased intensity um, along the bonding direction. And this, if the model is true, it should of course hold for all the individual um, orbitals for the dz square. You can also see a nodal plane on none. It's not as impressive, I would say, but again, impressively, I would say it's revealed here in the uh, ones where we look again from top of the dxz and yz orbitals, we do the symmetric and the anti-symmetric linear combination. And even these kind of really simple PowerPoint plots, I would say they nicely resemble the, the features that we see in the experiment, once with the increased intensity along the bonding direction and once with the nodal plane. So this is a very simple picture, linear combination of orbitals that you've all learned about also in your basic atomic and molecular physics classes. And of course, it scales with the distance between the atoms. The splitting gets larger when you come closer to each other. And eventually, when you go too far apart, of course, the splitting will not hold anymore. And it also depends even on the bonding direction when we move the atoms. All right, why did I tell this? Because you will see now in the slightly more complicated system, these nodal planes will help us identify whether we are in the regime of coupling um, of these individual um, atoms. And this really directly brings me to these magnetic atoms on niobium diselenide. And niobium diselenide is also a superconductor at a sufficiently high critical temperature. So I maybe have forgot to mention we measure at one Kelvin. So again, like lead, it's uh, roughly seven Kelvin. It's a van der Waals layered material, so we measure on the bulk crystal. Um, and this van der Waals um, termination actually makes us able to do atomic manipulation on the top, as you will see. But additionally, this quasi-two-dimensional nature of the superconductor has been nicely put forward 
as a system where you have particularly long range interactions. So this is by the, by the Paris group from Tristan and Crème. They've shown that iron bulk impurities, they show really long range oscillations of these u shibaruzum of states. And of course, at the surface, this may give, give then rise to the fact that we can nicely couple um, magnetic atom structures. Or in the group of Peter Lee, you wrote, they looked at molecules on this niobium diselenide, and these have been also shown to already couple at sufficiently um, long distances. So basically, this is what we want to now look at in more detail um, and uh, build larger structures. Now, so, but there's one thing that also is important for the sub, uh, system is that it's not only a superconductor, and actually I already show here the superconducting energy gap that's again measured with the superconducting tip looks slightly awkward, but this is because superconductivity is also slightly more complicated. It's probably an anisotropic superconductor. But in addition to superconductivity at low temperature, this material also hosts a charge density wave. And uh, you can see this immediately in the topography. So you see the atomic resolution of the terminating selenium layer, but also you can see that there's an additional height modulation on top. And for example, here you see these threefold shapes. So a high intensity would be in the center of the selenium atom. So here it's at this really on the center of a selenium atom. And this is how we identify the uh, periodicity of the charge density wave, but it's actually slightly incommensurate. And this is why you can find these two regimes um, basically, once it's really hollow centered with the maximum here, or the maximum of the charge density wave is centered on one of these selenium atoms, so it's chalcogenic centered. Now, the questions that we asked ourselves is would this somehow affect the Yushiva Rosenov states, and is it actually a template to build structures of, um, for example, these chains? And so we deposited iron atoms on this particular substrate, and when you first scan, you see that there are two individual, two species of different apparent height. Um, and that's actually naturally explained by two different hollow sites of the iron atoms. So they always want to sit in a hollow site with respect to the selenium lattice. But even then there are two distinct positions, namely one where there's this um, niobium atom located underneath and one where there's none. And um, well, basically when we look into these um, u shiba of states that of atoms that are in different of these lattice uh, sites, then they really look really different, but they all show Yushiva Rusinov states, so there must be still a residual spin of the iron atom, and you can actually identify it from this. Now, in the following of the talk, I would really like to focus only on atoms where we know the lattice site is on a hollow site with respect to the selenium. So all the other atoms we disregard for the, for the rest of the talk. But even then, so we have here a hollow site uh, iron atom that is sitting on the maximum of the charge density wave, while here it's closely uh, next to it. And even then the u shiba of states, they really differ. And uh, well, what we can show is that actually it depends on the position with respect to the charge density wave. I see that there is a question, but I don't see the question itself. I don't know if should I go ahead or should someone? Yeah, please just go ahead and, and uh, we'll read out the questions at the end. It's just people tend to write questions in the Q&A, but you just go ahead right now right. And at the end. We'll read them okay. out. Yeah, it just popped up that there's a question, so I didn't see. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so, so what I would like to, to show now is that it depends on the church density wave. And um, well, the idea is that, well, we can kind of drag out the information of the charge density wave if we look at an STM image and remove the atomic congregation by some Fourier filtering. And this is plotted here. So this is the, the density of states due to the charge density modulation. And um, now we also know where we always place the iron atoms. And we can then pick um, the energies of the two lowest Yushiba Rusinov states. And we see that actually the energy, they scale with um, the uh, density of states of the charge density wave. And while actually this has a quite a, uh, a natural explanation why they don't follow the whole charge density wave because some regions just don't exist because it has been shown also the charge density wave is energetically not favored on these metal centered sites. So basically there need to be domain walls in between such that these are forbidden regions. Nevertheless, what you can see if you follow it kind of qualitatively, um, you see that the Yushiba Rusinov uh, uh, scales and if you look back into our very simple equation of how you found the um, subgap states, 
Well, you see that it does scale with the normal density of states, which is actually given by the um, charge density wave. And so this is a natural explanation why the Yushi version of state, states, they depend on where we find the added charge. Now, this gives us one constriction when we want to now construct larger structures. So in the following, what we will do is we will always place our atoms with exactly the same, not only site with respect to the atomic lattice, but also with the same site with respect to the charge density wave. And this gives us the distance that we want to build up. And so this is the distance here of three, roughly of three atomic distances. And here you can see basically just the sequence so we can do atom manipulation um, of the individual iron atoms. And so this chain grows and grows with this a manipulation technique and eventually we will end up with these long chains. All right, so let's let's see how these Yoshiba reason of states evolve with, with chain length. And so for that, let me just highlight again the single atom and the spectra that we are measuring. So in the center is the blue one that is shown here on the top graph. Um, but what is important to notice is that there's a spatial extent along this uh, line, for example, and here's a color scale of all these spec uh, spectra where you find, of course, also different intensities that are slightly out of the atomic center. Now, this is one atom that we look at. Now we place a second atom, as I said, at the same charge density wave position. Um, and now what we see is that the uh, spectrum of the uh, uh, former atom changed and also of the atom that you see here. So in particular, see that you have basically a doubling of the number of states that you find inside the superconducting energy gap. So I marked it here by two arrows, how the splitting goes, and you see also shoulders here. Again, I think you can see it much more nicely in the line plots, because here you can nicely see that there's a doubling of the states, or let me just zoom in into this region here that's given by the dashed um, uh, uh, rectangle. So here, this deepest state, which we called alpha, it's split into two, as you can see, these spatial profiles, and also the beta state, the next one, is also split. Now, do we understand it in our former picture? So basically, in the monomer, we have the yoshiba rusinov wave function. In the dimer, when these atoms are close by, what we expected is this linear combinations, either uh, the symmetric one or the anti-symmetric one, which should have a nodal plane. And this is what we're going to map out now, similar to the case for the manganese lattice atoms on lead, just that the shapes are not as immediately jumping to your eye what's happening because they are much more complex. So this is the state that we map out the differential conductance. And then when we are in the dimer, so in this particular arrangement, we find that the intensity is split into two peaks. But the important thing is now here, and that's why I showed the manganese atoms again, is that here you don't have a nodal plane on the bonding line. Actually, you have increased intensity, while here you have a nodal line. So this is our indication that indeed we have the symmetric and anti-symmetric linear combination of these yoshiba rusinov states. And we do the same for the alpha state that is lower in energy. And also you can find a combination that is anti-symmetric, so with a nodal plane, and there's one that doesn't have a nodal plane. All right, so you can also find it really the shapes again. It's just more tedious than when you had this nice fourfold symmetry where everything looked like d orbitals. Here it's more tedious to look at, and probably in the quick uh, thing of this talk here, you may not recognize all the shapes again, but um, here I can just plot them again for, for better perception. But what I also didn't say is that here I changed the bias voltage that we are plotting here from positive to negative. And what does it mean? It means um, that we can follow the same shape now that it has crossed the Fermi level. And that means that this resonance has undergone this quantum phase transition. Remember that in the positive case, we had the free spin. In the negative, we had the um, a screen spin. And this is exactly what is happening due to interaction of the magnetic adder terms. Now, why is this the case? And here comes something on top of this hybridization. Namely, this is the magnetic coupling that we see now. And for that, let's let's see what magnetic states we have. So in principle, we can detect on the monomer four yushiba rusinov states. You can more uh, nicely see it in these line plots. So the four dashed lines. That means we have a spin two of the iron atoms on the surface. Now, what we have found is, and I don't want to go into the details, is that we believe that these lower, these alpha, beta, and gamma resonances, so the lower two and this upper one is uh, telling us that we are in the screened regime for these channels while one of them is not screened. And this is giving then rise to overall in this quantum mechanical total spin to a spin one half. 
Now, when we couple two atoms, it means that we have basically two atoms. So we have three screen states and one spin half is left over. Now we do this for two atoms that come close by. And well, individually, if there was no interaction, so we do excitations from the ground state to the excited state. So this would be excitation of this alpha state or of the beta state. Now, when we couple these, apparently there's some Arca-Kawai interaction. And the Arca-Kawai interaction is, of course, stronger when the spins are not screened. And therefore, it's favorable to undergo this quantum phase transition such that each individual atom is actually in a spin one state. And in total, of course, if we couple these spin one uh, atoms uh, in presumably ferromagnetically, then we end up with a total spin state of two. And so the importance is that Akakawai interactions are sufficiently strong to push these levels through the quantum phase transition. All right, so we know already the coupling of two atoms. We can now go on and see what happens to three atoms. And of course, the picture is getting more and more complicated. And I don't expect you to now follow these details of the shapes that we see here. It actually took us a long time to identify what we believe to see in the character of the states. But what you directly see is always the number of nodal planes. So for example, here we had the splitting of the beta states into three states. And here we see no nodal plane. Here you nicely see two nodal planes. And here you see one nodal plane. For the alpha state, of course, the same has to be true. Again, we try to look for, for nodal planes. Here we see one nodal plane. Here we see none of them. And here we believe that we see two nodal planes. So this picture, of, of course, of the hybridization goes along. You do linear combinations. And of course, if you are then in the trimer, you expect a state which has no, no nodal plane, then a single nodal plane, and then two nodal planes. So we believe that this hybridization picture that, that, that holds on also for the trimer. Uh, we can also plot in more detail the splitting and the shift of the levels. So you also see that there's already kind of a spreading of the states. And without going into the, the details of what we find here, the importance is that the alpha state, here you see the Fermi level. You come from the monomer, one atom, it has undergone a quantum phase transition to the dimer. And then we couple the third atom, and it actually already overlaps with the Fermi level again. The beta state is the one that's kind of more boring. It all stays at the same side of the Fermi level because it was anyway much further away. All right, so with this, we, we believe we understand the formation of states uh, in a hybrid picture. So you have hopping, but you also have magnetic interactions, this Arca-Kawai interaction. And now we want to address the question if, if you do larger chains. And here we go. And again, I don't want to uh, ask you to understand immediately all these pictures, but I want to put out the most characteristic, uh, obvious characteristics in order to understand what's happening. So the single atom, as I said, has these Yushi Baruzinov states that we label the deepest one alpha and beta. Then we go to the dimer, we see a splitting of these, and the trimer, we see a splitting into three. And these three cases I discussed in slightly more detail previously. Now, if we extend the chain even to even longer, then you can find, again, there's a really a change in the patterns that you can find. And you can do it longer and longer. And of course, there's always a change along the whole chain. So upon addition uh, of one atom, you see that something changes across the whole line. Importantly, what we also see is that you see everything is changing, not only at the side where you add something, is that you preserve horizontal mirror symmetry. So if you do a cut, here, a mirror line through the atomic chain, you always find that it stays symmetric. So whatever you do, if you put an atom, you really affect the whole chain. And what you can find is that the more and more you increase the chain length, there's always something that's delocalized over the whole chain. And while in these line plots, it looks slightly strange due to the, uh, um, yeah, due to basically the corrugation of the, with the atoms, we can just exemplarily point out here one of these change, uh, chains. So this is the seven atom chain. And we just look at these two energies that look the most pronounced in these line spectra. You find that these states are really well delocalized along the whole chain. OK, so we go on and we go on. And we can always trace and follow this. And I don't want to show you all these individual maps that we have stared at for hours and, and weeks, I would say. Um, but what you can see in these, these specs of, of spectra that basically you get kind of, it, let's call it a stabilization of this intensity at certain energies to which it, it evolves. 
And this is something that we can understand basically in this band formation picture. So imagine that you have your chain and you and you start to, you know, just, you know, like add atom by atom. And basically, first of all, of course, you only have nearest neighbor hopping, but then eventually if you have more space, you can have next nearest neighbor hopping and next next nearest neighbor hoppings. But I mean, of course, these higher order uh, hopping terms, they get less and less important. So when you start to increase the chain length, then you get a kind of a stabilization, of course, of the effect. So towards certain energies, or in this band picture, you basically start to form bands. And of, obviously, at some point, we can't resolve these individual states anymore. And so basically, here you have a sketch of this K-resolved picture that we believe to see. So for example, this lowest alpha state is giving one of these bands. And of course, it's always particle hole symmetric. And what you can, of course, see nicest when you do your tunneling spectroscopy are these you uh, the Van Hoff singularities of these bands. And now you understand why it kind of really falls into particular lines that you see with the most intensity eventually, because it's just the onset, so the Van Hoff singularities of these bands. And well, importantly, I told you this, this alpha state was the most interesting one. It kind of stayed at one side of the Fermi level. Then you had a dimer, it was crossing the Fermi level. So you had this quantum phase transition and then it really opened up. And so the bands really cross most probably asymmetrically the Fermi level. Okay, so this is an, an interesting uh, uh, system in that sense. So we have, we have seen that really we see this evolution of states, we, we believe we see band formation and we have so hopping on, but also magnetic coupling. And now, well, basically you can ask the question on how long can you make these chains? And I was mentioning this charge density wave that we always see in the background. So, so far it really didn't play any role because the magnetic atoms, the iron atoms were pinning the charge density wave and all the atoms were sitting really precisely in the same spot with respect to the charge density wave. But as you will see, this game you can't play uh, on uh, forever. So here's one of these original chains that, that I was showing you. And now it has been extended to a 51 atom chain. And if we do the spectroscopy along this chain, so now here you see the sample bias voltage again and this color plot, then you really see that there's something happening along this, this long chain. And well, before we understood what's happening in this regime, and really here you can find the identical spectra to what I was showing you before. You can see here this band that is crossing the Fermi level, you see the Van Hoof singularities again. But then eventually you see that here there's a down banding, so bending towards the Fermi level of this band. And then on this side, after it has done that, it really remains in a kind of different state. And the question is, how do we understand this? And for that, let's really look more closely into the charge density wave that we find in the background. And in order to understand this in more detail, we can do, again, a Fourier transformation of this uh, STM image and filter out by uh, Fourier filter, basically the atomic corrugation. And then we only remain with the corrugation due to the charge density wave. And now what you can already see is, let me just highlight this. So for example, in this part of the chain, we just connect the maxima of the charge density waves with the yellow lines. So as originally placed, the iron atoms stay on the maxima of the charge density wave. Well, when I look here, well, now the atoms are just in the minima of the charge density wave. And so how does this come along? Well, if you look here in the background, actually you see a kind of shift of the charge density wave and due to this incommensurability, um, eventually there has to be some um, uh, change from being top side to, to hollow side. And basically here we can identify that there's a change in the charge density wave. Also here defects of course influence the charge density wave. And that's the reason why the chain then also gets different here at this transition point between being located all along the maxima of the charge density wave and on the minima. Well, so what it means is that you have kind of two individuals chains. They, they seem to behave differently at the transition region. Apparently this, this Yushi Baruzinov bands, they bend down. And, but locally they behave as individual chains. And basically you could consider that you have magnetic chains in which you find a domain um, wall. All right, so let me 
put this into a context, so I was not mentioning that we have topological superconductivity in the chains. Um, I guess that's a question to many of you if, if we could observe it. So, well, I didn't show it, that's because we didn't see it, but I want to put it into context of what has been observed in magnetic chains and superconductors. So, well, the first paper was by the Yazdani group in 2014, where they have shown that iron chains um, uh, on a lead substrate, they actually do give rise to these uh, so-called Majorana states. So what, what have they found? So in this case, you see this superconducting lead substrate and by self-assembly, so they on lead, you can't do this atom manipulation. It's just too soft and you to just destroys everything once you want to do that. So you have to rely on the self-assembly technique. And what they find is are these iron chains because they have done it on a lead 110 surface. Impressively, they've also shown using spin polarized SDM that there's ferromagnetic spin structure. But the difference to the chains that I was showing you is that these atoms are really closely spaced. So you have really direct exchange coupling among the chains, and this gives rise to ferromagnetism along the chain. And when it's ferromagnetic, then they have shown that if they look into the subgap spectra, so with the superconducting uh, gap that you find here, you see a zero energy peak. And this zero energy peak, if you map it out in differential conductance maps, similar to, to what I was also using in the talk, is that this zero energy excitation is located at the very chain termination. And so in this sense, it has been interpreted as these Majorana states that you find in a ferromagnetic chain on top of a superconductor. And they have also identified then in follow-up works that there's this topological gap of a couple of hundred microelectron volts. And I should say, in, in view of these chains, there has been both theoretically, I can't list all of these, these papers, there has been a lot of work, but there's also been a lot of experimental work um, on, first of all, sulfur chamber chains, but also more recently by the Wiesendanger group, they also assembled atom by atom on the rhenium surface. But again, they were in this densely packed regime, and they also see some hints um, of uh, zero bias resonances, which could be Majorana states. But still, it's not that easy that when you say, okay, any chain that is in this strong coupling regime gives rise to Majorana states, that's also not the case. If you change your material, for example, if you take cobalt on lead 110, these chains, they can grow in exactly the same way. So it's a self-assembly process. Using spin polarized SDM, you can also show that they are ferromagnetically coupled. But then if you look for zero energy excitations, which should be the signature of the Majorana states, then they, they are also absent in this system. So by itself, dense coupling is not the, the criterion, but the physics here is slightly different. So basically what it tells you that you have this strong hybrid exchange coupling among the individual atoms. So you have your, your spin splits D bands and well, it depends on whether how many states are actually crossing the Fermi level on whether you can have the opening of a, two, a P wave gap in the superconductor and that being the prerequisite, of course, for seeing these Majorana states at the end of these ferromagnetic chains. And in the iron case, it's the lucky case. I mean, if you include spin orbit coupling, you have opening of gaps here. And um, basically there's one band crossing the Fermi level while apparently in the cobalt case, there's an even number of bands crossing the Fermi level, and that's kind of prohibiting you from seeing this topological superconductivity. So, so far, Majorana states have been observed in ferromagnetic cha uh, chains with direct exchange coupling. But as I also said, in principle, there's this other method where to look for topological superconductivity, namely in this weekly, in the dilute coupling limit where you look first of all at the U Shibaruzinov bands that are found inside of the superconducting energy gap. And while well, the condition has to be fulfilled that they even cross the Fermi level, I could just say there's, there's more conditions, of course, to have this topological superconductivity. In our case, we, we couldn't identify these signatures. So that's kind of the, the sad news for the system. But I believe that nevertheless, the detection of these Yushibaruzinov bands and signatures of quantum spin magnetism in these chains, it's by itself interesting. So with this, I would, I would just like to, to, to summarize. So I, I hope I convinced you that the, the physics of these Yushibaruzinov states is in that sense simple as once you have these states, you can treat them and, as hybrid states when you start to create larger structures of them. 
eventually it's not only that you have these hybrid states in dimers and trimers, but that you finally can form uh, bands along magnetic chains. Also, because of this, this quantum phase transition I was showing you, and there are Arca-Kawai interactions among these, it's really the quantum description of the spins that's important. In our case, we do have the charge density wave in the background. You can take it as a feature because now you can look into domain structures at different. On the other hand, you also see that you, the chains you can assemble on the very same domain is, is limited in size. But as a common, in principle, the, the, the length of the chain is already sufficient that you could, in principle, see Majorana states. They would not be hopefully overlapping too much. With this, I would really like to, to thank you, of course, for, for your attention and, and the people who, who did the work. So as I said, in particular, this is, this is, this is Eva, and now it's, it's Lisa taking over together with Gael Richt and from the, from the theory side, Sergio, uh, Jakob and, and, and Felix. Um, also, Christoph Mora as a guest professor has been recently involved in some theoretical descriptions of these works and Kai Rosnager, Sebastian Roth from, from Kiel. And um, well, yes, it's not without all the work of this, I would have been be able to present this. And of course, I would also like to, to thank the whole group and well, thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for this very exciting talk. And we also still have enough time for questions. So um, it's uh, good to see uh, Igor again on board, Igor Mazin. I think <laughs> you have been unmuted so you can ask the questions that you put in the chat yourself. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Katharina, for very interesting, um, unusual experimental uh, result. That's, well, I'm sure that there's a lot for theorists to think about this. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little bit of um, sidestep. I'm sure. Is it possible to do um, similar things on a monolayer niobium diselenide, or maybe trilayer? And you probably see where I'm, what I'm driving at. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I think you are driving for the easing superconductivity. That's right. <laughs> so uh, yes, I think it should be possible. It's just that I mean, like. Um, experimentalists are kind of bound to the samples that they first of all get. So it's quite um, already, I mean, niobium diselenide crystals you can get commercially, but really it would be, was really nice that we got these high quality crystals from, from Kai Rosnagel. The single layers, of course, you, you, you need to prepare somehow, right? And they need to be somewhere, either you need to contact them in your STM or still, I mean, you don't want them then to put them on a conducting substrate that again destroys everything that you want to inherit from your monolayer using superconductivity. Uh, that's not necessarily true. No? I think you can put it on uh, many conducting um, substrate and it would still work fine. You know, then there was experiment from uh, Feynman when he was, pu was putting that on uh, um, on on uh, ferromagnetic and still <laughs> saw a uh, lot of icing <clears throat> effects. And if you remember, there was some theory paper that were predicting qualitatively different um, response depending on how your spin is oriented yeah. along the plane or perpendicular to the plane. While for uh, pure isotropic S, there shouldn't be any difference. So if you even if you uh, see this uh, isotropic effect somewhat suppressed, you can still see them qualitatively. And in the same vein, I mean, you don't really have to go to um, single layer to see that. You can go to trilayer, and maybe, uh, and maybe if you if you can find a way to manipulate the orientation of your um, of your um, un, uh, whatever manganese or iron moment, whatever you are putting on niobium diselenide, uh, and uh, I don't know if you even know that, but maybe you can measure that. Then you can, if you still see the difference, that would already be uh, some remnant of, uh, uh, I think, superconductivity. You can talk about that uh, offline. But in principle, um, even in the bulk, you expect, and this, people didn't realize it initially, you expect some small admixture of Ising um, effect. It's like uh, controlled by the ratio of interlayer hopping and spin orbit. So there are a lot of things that can be done along that line. I, I agree. I think that, and as you just mentioned briefly, I think that the breaking of the symmetry already at the surface, it's not, of course, like a monolayer, but you start to maybe see, yeah, but like we, we don't see any experimental evidence in these chains. I, I, that's just my, so that's my plain answer, but maybe we can really discuss this more in detail uh, offline, yes. <laughs> okay, you, great. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. So next is uh, Igor Oshansky.
you've also been uh, promoted, you can just unmute yourself and then ask your question, go ahead. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. My question is about RKQY. So for a conventional RKQY, it's sensitive to the Fermi wave vector. So in principle, you can control it with the Fermi level. Do you have some option here? Or do you think about it or <laughs> it is not applicable? Uh, no, no, of course. It, it, so it's, first of all, the, the unfortunately, the Fermi surface is already rather complex of this layer of Bimbay But nevertheless, as you say, there should be one dominant wave vector that's actually mediating this Akakawai coupling. So the first thing is, of course, to do is like just change the, the distance between the uh, atoms. And then in principle, you should observe this oscillatory behavior, but actually it decays quite rapidly. And then I would say that, that we are in the unlucky case of here, the charge density wave is bothering us. Because ideally I would just do it as a function of distance and really, I mean, the atomic lattice would give you some digitization of the distances that you can do. But now on top, the charge density wave is giving us another digitization. So we only have three atomic distances and six atomic distances, and that's already quite far. So that would be the easiest to do. You can also do, I think that was also part of your question, like a direction dependence, if I understand. Um, so with the... We, yes, yes, correct. <laughs> yeah, so we, we are trying to, to look at this, but again, the charge density wave is this pattern on top that is in many cases bothering you, but we are actually trying to look at it all only in, in the dimer direction. Yes, I, so I think it's a good uh, suggestion, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so there was a question from Pascal Simon. I'm not sure if he can speak. If so, yeah, please, yeah. yes. Yes. I'm Hi, Katarina. Thanks for the nice talk. Actually, it was uh, the related questions. How can you be sure that you are, it's the RKKY effect and not uh, eliminate some both effect, direct overlap and RKKY? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't get... Is yes, it how can you... Or oh, direct overlap? I didn't... I yes, or both. Uh, okay, so, well, of course you... Yes. I agree with your question, but on the other hand, three atomic distances apart for direct exchange, I would consider unlikely. I agree that experimental evidence in that sense is, yes, you should, you should do the really the distance dependence from really one atomic distance to, to the next one to be really sure this is not the direct. Yes. But so total agree with you, <laughs> but I think like from my point of seeing it, three atomic distances. Yeah, it's, I understand that it's pretty yeah. large. It's quite some distance, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, then Tom, Tom Saunderson has a question. Can you Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, this might be slightly more, more basic than the, the other ones. I was just interested uh, because when you showed at the beginning of your presentation, the uh, density of states where you just had one impurity on, um, on your superconducting lead, I was curious about the fact that, so from my understanding, the di by dv um, conductance maps are essentially a convolution between the density of states of your tip and your surface. Uh, but you can see in some places you have negative points on uh, the di by dv map. So is there something that I'm not quite understanding about um, what these things actually are representing? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's um, wait. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's all it's, the way back at the beginning. It's always a, it's always the first slide, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I wasn't I wasn't sure whether just you know like starting to share again or just going backward would be much more would be faster. So I think you're referring to this exactly. huge negative differential conductance that we have here, and I think that you partially gave the answer already yourself. It's really because we see the convolution of our superconducting tip density of states with the substrate. So basically, um, if, you, if you were to measure with a normal tip, it just would look like almost like just like a peak. But because you have this peak density of states in the, in the, in the tip and this peak density of states in the substrate, like really when they align, you have a very, very large conductance. And then when you misalign them slightly, the current is really dropping because you are gap against gap. So, so no, you have now density of states against gap on, on either side kind of. And that makes your current really drop. And therefore you see this peak in, as with this negative differential conductance afterwards. So it's kind of a, okay. like a technical detail. So if you were to deconvolve it to remove the effect of the density of states of the, of the tip, then it would just look like a, like a peak. 
Are you so so what you're saying is specifically it's related to the fact that you're using a superconducting tip right as right. your um as as okay right because okay, that's thank the you. really sharp density of state yes yes i mean you can see this effect also in other systems um but typically then i mean basically it's a change of your tunneling matrix element you so you see it at variations also above some decoupled molecules for example but not not as pronounced and there you see it with normal tips as well so like the effect is a tunneling matrix element thing but it becomes particularly strong uh, when you have this really this very sharp density of states yes okay thanks okay do we have any further questions maybe while people are thinking just one question for myself you mentioned at the beginning that it was important to get these crystals with high quality from kai so what is for you high quality is this like surface roughness or number of defects or what is what is for you a high quality crystal number of defects because okay. if you yeah. if you so so this this nice work from the paris group is actually they have had these crystals where you see apparently magnetic impurities already in the bulk so they have found them by chance so it's and they say that is most probably iron because that's uh, like a, um one of the most abundant uh, impurities and so if we want to build a chain on top we really don't want anything else that's close by in the bulk that might might perturb this and in these samples, we we basically don't find any magnetic impurity. Okay. Like, like this, it's very. I mean, you can cleave it, and it's super flat. That's not the problem for any of these van der Waals crystals mm. if they are sufficiently large. I should point out. So, mm. it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there's a question from Kudayok John. Um, I don't know if we can unmute him. Otherwise, I'm just going to read out the question. Uh, could we have, can you can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, otherwise, I will just do that. So um, on the first part, as a result of the magnetic proximity effect, magnetic atoms can, in principle, spin split the QP density of states in of lead. Yet I could not see clearly the spin splitting effect in your tunnel conductance spectra. Is this due to the spin orbit scattering or exchange coupling strength is too weak? Okay, uh, so I hope I understand the question correctly. So basically what you're heading for is, uh, is this tetra of Meserve splitting that one should see when you have it in the magnetic field, but these, these local magnetic atoms, they are just too weak. They don't do that. They don't split the quasar particle density of states. So, but somehow I kind of got the first part of the question, maybe that, that it, the question was why, why you may see two peaks here. Um, this is not due to that fact. So this is already in the background spectrum. And this is because lead is also not such a simple superconductor. It's actually a two band superconductor, again, due to the complexity of the Fermi surface. And basically you have two disjunct, disjunct, whatever, uh, Fermi surfaces, and they have slightly different um, pairing um, uh, strength. And therefore you see two BCS like okay. peaks. So this is not the splitting due to any magnetic um, uh, influence, okay. neither mm. magnetic field nor magnetic, and it doesn't do that. But if you calculate, um, so for example, like what the magnetic moment of one of these single atoms is, by, and, and you have all these, you know, like many body interactions, it's just a single atom is just very, very, very weak. I don't, you, you okay. can't see a splitting. If I so it's not not the typical thing yet for Mr. Tedrov. No, no, no. Yeah. It's, okay. It's just, mm. yeah. Okay. Great. Any further questions? So, Mr. John is happy with the answer. So there's one question. So Tom, do you have another question? Is your... Yeah, I have another question. Okay, go uh, ahead. I was just thinking, um, so we have obviously uh, these ferromagnetic chains on the surface of a superconductor. What would happen, would, would we maybe get some kind of similar effect with an, an either an antiferromagnetic chain or just sticking an antiferromagnetic material like an interface between a superconductor and would, would we see something interesting happening there as well? Yes, I think you would. So actually, <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is more the work of the of the theoreticians. That, so Felix von Oppen and his, his group are working on it like Okay, do you see ferromagnetic? So, what would be the different excitation spectra, whether you have a ferromagnetic chain or an antiferromagnetic chain? And actually, it really makes a difference in the excitation spectra. And so, let me just try to put it into simple words. So, in this ferromagnetic, if it is ferromagnetic chain, any single excitation is just like it looks like a single particle excitation on this background of your spins. 
And therefore it really looks like this bands and it really has this similarity and you see these Van Hoof singularities. When you do it on top of an antiferromagnet, basically this moving of this excitation is blocked due to the neighboring alignment of these, these spins. And then the excitation spectra, they look, they look much more complicated. Um, so, so we haven't seen that in experiment, but this, this has been, yes, actually this is what, what Felix and this group are, are actually looking at into this, how the excitation spectra change. So this would be antiferromagnetic chains. And now you asked for if you put it on an antiferromagnet or in, at the interface to an antiferromagnet, I think that probably one can extrapolate from there because yeah. it's all about the, the, the coupling to it. So I guess that goes along the same lines. Yes, actually, I, I think maybe one of the papers that you flashed up or one of the ones that look at trying to understand magnetic chains on a surface, they actually theorize you need a spiral of, of um, spins, <laughs> which is, gets even more crazy. <laughs> okay, th thanks for that hint, because I think that this is, so a lot of theory work has been done also on these, these spin spirals for in, the, in terms of this Majorana works. Um, so I was just saying that these are like from the experiment from Ali Yazdani, it looks like it's a ferromagnetic chain, but in the first place, then when they were seeing these excitations, these Majorana modes, theory, a lot of theory uh, has said that if you have a spin spiral, this is what you need uh, in order to get this uh, Majorana modes, because basically think of it in a simple way. If you just have, a, it's somehow connected to your question, what happens? You have your Cooper pair condensate and how it scatters off your magnetic impurities. And if it was like a perfect ferromagnet and a perfect S-wave superconductor, basically there's no way to scatter in, so to say, in this classical thing. Uh, but then people, or the theory said, well, if you have, if you have spin orbit coupling, then you can. Um, or if you have the spin spiral, then basically you can due to this uh, change of the, of the symmetries. And this is one possibility. And theoretically, there's been lots of papers. And so I think Pascal was just asking a question. So he has worked a lot of this, um, but then the, the kind of way out, if you see ferromagnetism experimentally and still get the Majorana states, is that you have spin orbit coupling in the bulk, which kind of loosens this, this um, condition on how these super, these Cooper pairs scatter off. So that's the alternative in the explanation of either you have a spin spiral on top of an S wave superconductor, or you have a ferromagnet, but you have a superconductor with strong spin orbit coupling, which for lead is obviously the case. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that actually, because really there was a lot of theoretical work on that. Thanks for hinting. At that. It's okay. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. I think it's great as well. Like I think it I think this kind of data is very exciting for theorists because it's as close as you possibly can get to theory as well. <laughs> 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 okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks. So um, I do not see any further questions. So. Uh, last last chance, last call for questions. Oh, there's one more by Igor Sandalov. Oh, today is Igor Day, so please go ahead, <laughs> <Yeah>. Igor. <laughs> you can unmute yourself. You have now the ability to speak, Igor. Just unmute yourself, and then you can speak. Mute, okay. Yes, yes, now it works. Mute, go okay. ahead. Yeah, my, my question concerns uh, quantum physics. Uh, the matter is that uh, in order to have contribution to conda, you need uh, effective uh, negative interaction. And uh, this means that uh, actually a mixing interaction should be large enough, which should decrease when, uh, uh, well, uh, how uh, you uh, define this strong coupling regime uh, because uh, there are different interactions. What do you mean under strong coupling regime? So, I'm not 100% sure if I understand your question. Let me go back well, uh, to, to this part. The, ma the matter is that uh, you have, yeah, you have uh, this critical exchange, yeah? Right. And uh, this is thing. critical exchange between what and what? So, in this condo regime, obviously, you, you're right, you need this antiferromagnetic exchange coupling to the substrate. Yes, yes. And so when I, I would say, like, if it's, if it's strong, so, it's of, so the sign of this exchange coupling doesn't change. It's always, in, as you say, I mean, you always need it to be antiferromagnetic to see condo. And also for this, it's no condition for the Yushiba Rusinov states, but then if it's coming at the same time, it has to be antiferromagnetic. 
And what I mean between strong and weak is really this transition between um, it's a level crossing. So basically, no, let me go. Let me go to this thing. So what is your excited state or what is your ground state? So basically what I mean is if, if I'm in the ground state, there's weak exchange coupling. And at some point there is strong. So where we bind the quasi particle, this is the same in, in, the, in the quantum spin model. So like it doesn't have any, um, so in the, I, I could just down here write the condo coupling strength or write it as TK. And then there would be for these subgap spectra, a critical coupling strength or a critical TK at which you go from this ground state to this ground state. But effectively, it's really a level crossing, which is the ground state and which is the excited state. And this is called quantum phase transition in many cases. It doesn't have directly an analog. And if you only have condo physics, there's of course no, no critical condo, then, then it's only condo, right? But it's the same, con it's the same exchange coupling, I would say. I'm well, not sure if I made myself okay. clear this or... understood. This understood, but okay. uh, uh, this right slide. Uh, the matter is that uh, there are two components which contribute. One is uh, uh, this uh, Erka Kawai like interaction, and oh. another is uh, this local interaction depending on uh, particular anisotropy which experience your localized spin. And this means that probably you should have different uh, contributions when you use different cuts of substrate. Right, right, you're right. Okay, now I got your question. So basically you're going to the larger structures when additionally now you have the competition to Akakawai coupling between, yes, the, the phase diagram gets terribly complicated if this is what you're heading for. And you can have these contributions and also in, along which direction you go, if I understand, yes. Correctly. <laughs> yes, it's, it's getting more complicated. In this picture, there's no Akakawai. The Akakawai comes along in the picture when you have another impurity close by. And then, of course, that's again competing because that's also going through the substrate. Yeah. And yeah. that's why basically this, this quantum phase transition that we see in the dimer really comes along from the fact, yes, you gain more energy if the Akakawai coupling can proceed because you have unscreened spins. Um, instead of being in the this regime where basically your your Akakawai interaction is reduced because your spin is screened. So it's another dimension in this phase diagram that would kind of be a third dimension yeah. when, when you have this quantum phase transition. That, that is that where you well, were at, uh, it's it's but it's part of this. Uh, the matter is that the uh, Erkakawa uh, interaction uh, contribution also strongly depends on uh, proximity uh, to Fermi level. And when uh, proximity to Fermi level uh, yes. is uh, large, then uh, yes. Erkakawa interaction uh, decays mm -hmm. not as a one over uh, R in cube, but in squared. Yes. And uh, this uh, also uh, has to be seen somehow. Question is, is it possible or not? Yeah, I guess if, if one, if one, so the density, you, if one could gate the sample, then you would immediately see it. We can't, <laughs> or at least, yes. I mean, the charge density wave already is kind of a handle on it because that changes your, well, but that doesn't change the film. I have to think uh -huh. about it, but, it's it's not it's not trivial to do it experimentally, I would say. Yes. But I agree it's it's a nice question to Okay, to different yeah. difficulties to separate. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, good. So I think our time is up. So please join me in thanking the speaker again. And yeah, I think it was really exciting to hear about, I mean, the SCM is always very nice to see, you know, atomic, uh, I mean, not orbitals, but states. I think that's always, always cool. So thanks a lot, Katarina. And then thank I think you. we can stop the recording. Yeah. And yeah, thank everyone for participating and hope to see you all next week.